Just a little quick note to anybody that's about to listen to this episode. Um, I apologize. I kind of fucked up the audio on it. I don't know exactly what happened. Um, the audio is really, really annoying and weird sounding, and uh, I apologize for that, but I'm not going to go back and record the entire two hours and 54 minutes of it again. So I'm sorry you just have to deal with it for this time. I promise the audio quality will be better in subsequent episodes. All right, here it is. This is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished. Where is the church heading? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason. So if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly... May you ponder the truths you've heard. May they help you become even better than you were. Skepticize everything. Welcome to episode 22 of the Naked Mormonism podcast. I'm Bryce Blankenagle, and thank you for joining me. Last episode, we covered the two and a half month period from early April to late June 1830. From the first congregation of the church to casting out demons to two trials and acquittals, Joe had a very busy spring that year. It's taken us a while to get to this point, but now we can really see Joe start to embody the personality of the token cult leader that he slowly became. So far, he's had some personality traits that have been leaning in his favor of becoming this cult leader. However, he hasn't actually had the infrastructure built under his control to actually lead anybody more than just his closest friends that believed everything he said. Well, it takes a lot of work and travel to set up such an infrastructure. I guess it's either work by Joe himself or just being able to outsource the work by using his closest friends that had a special place in the church. I mean, we know that Joe hated doing work, but he liked giving commands and was good and convincing at it, apparently. Giving commands in order to build an empire on is exactly what he had been trying to do for so long, but now he had a tool. Not just a tool like Precious or Mr. Hat, because those weren't very compelling when it came to trying to legitimize Joe to newcomers. I'm talking about a powerful physical tool that could be used to control the very hearts and minds of these newcomers. It was a book. Many people in the past have stood on the mantle of the Bible and have used it to build entire empires of theocratic rule. A religious text is something that can be so useful to the person preaching from it. The Bible and the Book of Mormon are written in ways that allow and almost require a person to think deeply and introspectively. There's enough material in them to extract pretty much anything wanted out of the chapter and verse-like structure. For example, you can rationalize the Israelites following the command of God to go kill the Canaanites down to the suckling children. If you only look a few verses later in Deuteronomy 21, 8 through 9, this is what it says, quote, Forgive your people, Israel, whom you have redeemed, O Lord, and do not place guilt of innocent blood in the midst of your people, Israel, and the blood guiltless shall be forgiven them. So you shall remove the guilt of innocent blood from your midst when you do what is right in the eyes of the Lord, end quote. You see, once you read that, you can justify killing people or taking innocent blood because things can be interpreted so many ways when reading a holy book. 
The point is, when somebody professes to understand that holy book better than most, other people tend to fall in line behind that person because they believe that it'll somehow help them become more godly or become more like the person that they're trying to emulate. A charismatic Jesus preacher can gain a pretty large following running off just the Bible. Now picture how much more powerful that preacher becomes when he understands the Bible and God so well that God came to him to write another testament of Jesus Christ. Picture being the religious sect that worships the Old Testament in all its horrible glory, the New Testament with its ass-kicking Messiah and torture porn ending, and the New New Testament, Jesus in America. That is the platform that Joe was running on. He was so righteous and uh, pious that God and Jesus came to him to be the next author in the long lineup of authors that make up the Bible. And Joe could work that position like a charisma-seeping fame whore. This is how he could gain a following, but also serves to explain a little bit about the so-called persecution that Joe had to endure that we talked about last episode. The problem was, Joe was claiming that he was so righteous that he was given magic powers by Almighty God to write a book in the same way he looked for buried treasure and then charge people money for that book. That didn't sit well with people that knew Joe's history or were familiar with his character. That's precisely why these people took him to trial twice in one week, basically for being a bold-faced fraud. The people didn't like being lied to, and they knew Joe was just lying through his teeth the instant he said he had found buried gold plates and translated them into a holy third testament of Jesus in America. Honestly, I don't particularly blame the people. I mean, Dr. Oz recently went to trial for endorsing remedies to cure actual illnesses that don't work. Yet, he still has a TV show, wearing his scrubs that have never had blood on them, and continues to pull in a multi-million dollar salary, even though it's been demonstrated that he's a fraud to a certain extent. Well, Joe was just an early 19th century snake oil salesman like Dr. Oz is today. However, he had a special new Jesus book to help him claim divinity in his practices and claims. So let's move on to what Joe and company were up to after all that happened last episode. Joe had been through a trial that was demanded by a mob and gone off on a technicality. Naturally, the mob wasn't satisfied with what had happened, so they were seeking retribution for this little lapse in the judicial system. Everybody in town knew that Joe was a fraud and had been for quite some time. Now he had taken his fraud activities to the next level by peddling this book that he came up with in the same exact way he had hunted for buried treasure, the rock in the hat. For the most part, the people of Colesville weren't buying it. They weren't even renting it. They just rejected what Joe was claiming outright because of, well, little more than his reputation. They knew him as a fraud, and they didn't need to read his fraudulent Bible fan fiction in order to determine it. They just knew. Well, Joe couldn't just let this so-called persecution, quote-unquote, go unfed. He couldn't just let the fire in the town die. He had to go in and stoke the flames a little more. That's right, less than a week after he was basically chased out of town by a mob, after he had escaped the legal system twice, Joe tried to return to Colesville along with Ollie Cowdong all over to reap a few very young seeds that were planted during Joe's time there, and with the help of the Knight family. This later journey, a mere week or two after the trials, was an immediate failure. Thanks, once again, to the angry mob. The Mormon home base in Colesville was the Knight household, which is probably where they held their congregations. See, the entire Knight family had converted along with some of their friends, the Jollies and Richard Peterson, and Joe considered this one of his three congregations. They may or may not have been having actual Sunday meetings as mandated by Joseph, but regardless, they were considered his third flock of early Mormonites. 
Well, in order to harvest these recently planted seeds of faith, Joe brought his tool, Ollie, of course, to baptize and convert everybody that the Joes and Jollies had been talking to. But upon arrival, the mob almost instantly gathered at the night house. Somebody must have seen Joe wandering into town, or maybe it was just a rumor that was circulated, but the townspeople wanted Joe the fuck out of Colesville. Let's read from History of the Church, Volume 1, to understand how Joe recounts the situation himself. Quote, this is subtitled, Further Molestation at Colesville by the Mobs, the Revelation Embodying the Vision of Moses' Second Flight from Colesville. After a few days, I returned to Colesville, in company with Oliver Cowdery, for the purpose of confirming those whom we had been forced to leave for a time. We had scarcely arrived at Mr. Knight's when the mob was seen collecting together to oppose us, and we considered it wisdom to leave for home, which we did without even waiting for any refreshments. Our enemies pursued us, and it was oft times as much as we could do to elude them. However, we managed to get home, after having traveled all night except a short time, during which we were forced to rest ourselves under a large tree by the wayside, sleeping and watching alternately. End quote. So this mob hated Joe and the Book of Mormon enough that they resorted to literally chasing them out of town a second time. I also think it's funny how Joe records it. He said it in this way, quote, We considered it wisdom to leave for home, end quote. It's just hilarious that he tells it like he was in control of the situation the whole time. It's pretty clear that the mob literally forced them out of town, and Joe and Ollie didn't have much say in the situation. I mean, what could they do? They could either leave town or get the shit kicked out of them or possibly even get lynched by this mob. There really wasn't a choice there unless Joe was willing to face his martyrdom this early in his journey. But let's face it, Joe never faced an actual martyrdom even when he was supposedly martyred. There's no way he would just sit there and take it like some kind of ammonite or self-immolator at this early stage in his journey. He had the sense to turn tail and make like a tree and get the fuck out of there. Anyway, I'm not sure exactly where Joe was calling home at this point. It's recorded that they traveled all night and arrived home. However, Colesville is 95 miles from Fayette, 148 from the Manchester Palmyra area, and 375 miles from Harmony, Pennsylvania, which Harmony is where Joe was calling home only a few months prior and directly after this. So let's assume the most logical thing, that Joe was calling Harmony home during this time. It should have taken him and Ollie a solid 100 hours of straight walking to get there. That, that takes a week. How was this done in one night with very little rest? The world may never know. Maybe it was done by the same way that Joe was able to run for three miles with the 220-pound gold plates under his arm only three years prior to this scenario, but I guess that's just speculation. So let's continue in the History of the Church, Volume 1, page 97. Quote, this is subtitled, Reflections on Persecution. Thus we were persecuted on account of our religious faith, in a country the constitution of which guarantees to every man the indefeasible right to worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience, and by men, too, who were professors of religion, and who were not backward to maintain the right of religious liberty for themselves, though they could thus wantonly deny it to us. End quote. All right, let's talk about this for just a minute here. First, Joe getting off on technicalities is a perfect demonstration of his religious liberty in the country. His rights were never violated during everything we've talked about so far. Secondly, last episode, I said that I couldn't really understand why these people hated Joe so much. Well, now I'm starting to get a better grasp on it, but it seems like there might be something more to it. Maybe there's some magic key that made Joe such a pariah, or maybe I'm just not seeing the picture as a whole, 
Or maybe it's what I was told about Joe growing up that's currently obfuscating my view of the situation now. I mean, we're taught in the church that Joe was a holy and pious prophet of God. He was unflappable and infallible, and every bit of persecution he endured was completely unfounded and was therefore incited by the devil himself. When you read Joe's versions of the history, it was always the devil or evil designing persons or something to that effect. Joe and the church by extension completely remove the human element from the entire situation. Joe was a person, and we have to try and get into his mind. What's more, everybody that was persecuting him was an individual person, too. I don't know exactly what was going through Joe's mind. However, we can surmise that he asserted his convictions, theological and otherwise, with a full heart and full intent. Whether or not he actually believed his own bullshit is another discussion entirely. That being said, I think it might be even harder to get into the minds of the people in the mob as opposed to Joe's mind. They weren't just a faceless mob. They were bakers and farmers and teachers and all kinds of people in a regular small community for every other minute of their lives that they weren't part of this mob. My question about this is, why did these people hate Joseph Smith so much? I know when a person feels threatened, they will go to some pretty extreme lengths to ensure their safety. Even if the threat is just an idea, existentially, it has the same effect on the acting agents. So, is this the heart of the matter? When it comes to people wanting to get rid of Joe so much, I'm really trying to get a grasp on it. Did the people of Colesville honestly think that their faith was in this much jeopardy? Was it enough that they thought Joe was going to pull them away from their existing faith or belief in God? Or was there something else to it? I'm asking this in an honest pursuit of the actual answer. The only thing that I can bring myself to think of was the townspeople must have been afraid of a wolf in treasure seeker's clothing. I mean, let's face it, when you have the right religion, every other religion out there is clearly of the devil. Anybody raised in a more fundamentalist religion of any type should be able to empathize with this. I mean, shit, the LDS church calls the Catholic church the great and abominable church for that same reason. I think these people just saw Joe as clearly possessed by the devil and acting on carnal desires alone. He was just there to bring this country to its knees with, well, the newest wave of a false Jesus to consume its way across the burned over district like so many before Mormonism had. If they truly thought that Joe was sent by, possessed by, or controlled by the devil in any way, shape, or form, this level of hatred for Joe seems justifiable in like a primitive mindset sort of way. I wonder if he was labeled with the same label that every threat to society is labeled by overly conservative people. I wonder if anybody at that time called Joe the Antichrist for what he was doing. It seems like that opinion would have been enough of a motivating factor alone to make the mob hate Joe and forcibly devolve him to the level of pariah that he never ultimately recovered from. Like I've said before, he was a polarizing individual. The people that knew him or had ever been burned by his shenanigans must have hated the very thought of him. Put yourself in their shoes. Picture the person you hate most on the entire planet, liar, lover, anything. They could be somebody you know or just the idea of somebody like Hitler or some crazy person like that. Now picture that person coming to you with a book in their hand that they wrote, mind you, calling it a new testament of Jesus Christ and calling you to repentance, thus completely shaking the foundation of your deeply held religious beliefs or just offending you on the onset. You either agree with that person and follow them, or you hate them and do whatever necessary to get rid of them. People that lived in 1830 aren't much different than we are today. Arguably, they're no different. They are subject to the same tendencies and emotions that we're subject to today. They simply had less tools to deal with reality than we have now. Well, I think this gives us some insight into Joseph Smith and his character. 
Beyond that, Joe had to practice. I mean, he had been swindling people out of habit and necessity for most of his formative years, but he had never tried to purchase somebody's soul using his own church before. When he was first starting out, he could only get his best friends to join this crazy new Jesus cult. But of course, as he practiced and gained more followers, he got better and better at his bullshit. There's also a degree of separation here that can't be ignored. I mean, the top of his pyramid was formed out of the few people that Joe trusted the most, and by extension, they spent a lot of time with him. The people that were closest to him, like Oliver Cowdery, Emmett Smith, and the Whitmer family, were the most capable of calling Joe out on his bullshit. And whenever they did throughout the history, massive schisms happened and rival factions of Mormonism emerged from the ashes. Well, the people that spent the most time around Joe knew him best on a personal level, which is something that the later members of the church didn't have access to. The more people Joe got to follow him, the less each new person knew about him or spent time with him, to the point that he could make his followers believe almost anything without them ever questioning him as an equal human being. He was just the prophet of the church. Joe had built this separation mechanism into the church. Now try and extrapolate that separation out 180 plus years, and there you have the key to how Mormons feel about Joe and their leadership today. That's why they carry such high revere in the church, and when true-believing Mormons hear about Joe getting arrested, they're able to say, well, he was just a man like the rest of us, and it has no bearing on him being a prophet of God. Or for a more pertinent example, when Mormons hear that Joe was attacked by multiple mobs, but was somewhat deserving of it because of his actions, they can rationalize it away by saying, if he wasn't a true prophet of God, then why were people so opposed to him? His persecution proves that he's a real prophet. I mean, I know that may sound ridiculous, but that is the mindset that Mormons have about Joe and the type of person he was, and it extends to the leadership today. Joe was somehow separated from all the bad shit that he did. Like when it comes to the golden plates or anything related to the church he organized, that's the one exception to all his lying and swindling to true believing Mormons. It's just this one thing that Joe never lied about because he was, uh, I guess, speaking and acting for God when it came to the church. I mean, trying to reconnect these two opposing perspectives of Joe is paramount for a Mormon that's transitioning out of the Mormon church. With everything that I've learned about Joe, it's given me an all-new perspective of the man Joseph Smith. But as I related at the beginning of this rant, I still have a hard time compartmentalizing the cardboard cutout Joseph Smith that I know from my childhood, apart from the actual Joe that reality is slowly constructing right in front of us. It seems like the believing Mormon is talking about a completely different Joseph Smith than the Joe we can construct from documented history, which is what we're trying to do on this show. So why was Joe so persecuted? I want to get to the bottom of this. Like I said earlier, I don't know if my previous opinions of Joseph Smith are what's keeping me from filling in this ever-important piece of the puzzle. The natural explanation at hand seems ample enough to justify the mob's actions, but it just seems like there's something more there. I'm hoping to get some perspective from the listeners here. I'm really working to understand this, as well as try and articulate it in a way that fills the void. If anybody has any idea of why Joe was the hated pariah that's become the center of this show, I want to hear it. I want opinions from ex-Mormons who have to deal with this same dichotomy of character that I'm dealing with right now, and I would also like to get some never Mormons to chime in and offer their perspective because they don't really have to deal with the burden of suppressing the reported version of the prophet Joseph Smith like ex-Mormons have to as opposed to the real Joseph that we're trying to construct here. Was Joe so hated because he was the local treasure hunter turned antichrist or he was an habitual liar or was there something more there that I'm just not seeing? This will be a recurring question throughout the entire history of the church. 
I want to know what drove Lilburn Boggs to sign the Mormon extermination order, which basically gave free license to anybody to shoot and kill any Mormons on sight. I want to know why Joe and the early Mormons were chased out of their homes repeatedly. I want to know why hundreds of people gathered in Carthage to lynch Joe and Hiram. There was something about Joe and the early Mormons that really unnerved people and caused them to act very harshly toward the Mormons. These social opinions of Joseph, along with the mob mentality, ultimately precipitated Joe's death by the bloodied rifle barrels of the mob. I mean, speculation on Joe's character aside, let's try and talk about the next segment of what Joe included in his History of the Church, Volume 1. Let's talk about the persecution here. Quote, For instance, Cyrus McMaster, a Presbyterian of high standing in his church, was one of the chief instigators of these persecutions. And he at one time told me personally that he considered me guilty without judge or jury. The celebrated Dr. Boyington, also a Presbyterian, was another instigator of these deeds of outrage, while a young man named Benton of the same religious faith swore out the first warrant against me. I could mention many others also, but for brevity's sake, we'll make these suffice for the present. End quote. All right, this was Joe's shit list of people that were, you know, the primary persecutors of the mobs. After a, a couple hours of furious Googling, I couldn't find any mention of these guys that wasn't somehow related to a publication by the church itself that actually used this passage specifically to extrapolate on. I tried and tried to find a journal entry or minutes from their Presbyterian congregations that refer to Joe or his church in some way, but the search just came up dry. Some of the Mormon publications about these guys are somewhat fascinating, you know, implying some kind of conspiracy among them and others to persecute Joe or demonizing whatever religious sect they were part of. It's lots of fun to read what the Mormons have to say about the people that were beating up on their favorite prophet. But as I dug into the names surrounding these guys, it did become somewhat clear. It seems like McMaster and Benton were part of the same Presbyterian congregation the Stowells were members of. Why this is significant is the implication of the connection between the 1826 trial and the two 1830 trials. All right, follow me down this rabbit hole for a second. So we have boss man Josiah Stoll that was one of the few witnesses that came to Joe's defense for all three of the trials. And boss man Josiah Stowell is the center of everything here. Keep that in mind. So according to a permit that we have on record for some dam building project in New York, boss man Joe and Cyrus McMaster were business partners in 1826 and probably knew each other for a long time before and after that. Well, Cyrus McMaster's brother was David McMaster, who was one of the prosecuting witnesses during the 1826 trial. Cyrus was a prosecuting witness during the 1830 trials, so the McMasters officially hated Joseph Smith. Cyrus McMaster was married to a woman named Electa Bridgman, who was the sister of Peter Bridgman. Now, hopefully that name rings a bell, but if not, it's okay. There's a lot of names thrown around on this show, and this name first popped up 11 episodes ago. Peter Bridgman was the person who filed the complaint against Joe in the first place in 1826, which brought Joe to trial for quote-unquote glass-looking in South Bainbridge, New York, a crime for which he was convicted. Keep with me here for just a minute longer. Next in Joe's list of so-called persecutors was, quote, the celebrated Dr. Boynton, end quote, who was actually named Nathan Boynton. This guy was also probably a member of the Presbyterian church that the McMasters attended, as well as the Stowells. Well, Nathan Boynton was married to Lefa Stowell, who was bossman Josiah Stowell's sister, making Boynton an in-law of the Stowells. Next in the list, we have Abraham Benton. Not Boynton, Benton. He's the odd man out that shares no familial ties with the rest of the family web we've just strung together. 
with you know all of those previous names. However, Benton did study medicine under this celebrated Dr. Boynton and was probably an assistant or just worked closely with Boynton. Benton doesn't come up anywhere before this point when we're talking about the 1830 trial, which puts the timing as something of an oddity. The reason I say that is because of Abraham Benton's cousin. This is a tangent, but hang in there for a second. Harriet Benton, his cousin, a very short time before the 1830 trials, married a man named Lyman White. This is a man that'll be recurring frequently throughout our examination of church history. A month or two after the 1830 trials, Harriet Benton and Lyman White packed up and moved to Ohio, where they were pastored by the one and only Hingepin Sidney Rigdon. They would become Mormonites soon after this. The reason I'm saying that the timing is something of an oddity is because of the connection to the Mormon religion that Abraham Benton had. He hated Joe and his church and, well, their little Frankenstein Book of Mormon just as much as the next guy in line, but he had this small family connection to the church through Harriet Benton. If there's one thing we know about the early church, it's when one person in a family is taken away by the Mormon cult, the rest of the family turns on it and does whatever possible to stop it. Shit, I mean, that's what happens today with people inside all types of religious sects, not just Mormonism. I think it has something to do with not wanting the devil to have power over the people's loved ones which I kind of iterated earlier with why people might have hated Joseph so much. Well, this was a connection with a negative outcome that Abraham Benton had in relation to Joe's church. The church was in the very early stages of stealing away his cousin Harriet and forcing her to move around with the Mormons as Lyman White's wife. But the problem with the timing is just that. When they moved to Ohio to be pastored by Hinchpin Rigdon, the church hadn't spread out there yet. The church had three official meeting places at this point, and Mentor Ohio was not yet one of them. It soon would be, but it wasn't yet. There are people that claim a significant role by Hingepin Rigdon in the organization of this early church, and based off the information presented in a few episodes of this show, I would be one of those people that would posit that claim. There are people that quote Rigdon with very interesting claims before he supposedly knew about the Book of Mormon. I mean, nothing was said directly, but there are subtle hints that Rigdon was priming his masses to become Mormonites well before he was supposed to have even read the Book of Mormon and known about the church. Well, Harriet Benton would have fallen victim to this little Joe and Rigdon conspiracy right in the time frame that we're currently examining. If Harriet was being sucked into the early church, it might serve to explain why Abraham Benton was so violently opposed to the church, and why Joe called him one of the three worst persecutors of his early church, on par with the people who sued him for being a disorderly person on two other occasions. Either that or Ben was just friends with the other people we've talked about just now and hated Joe just to be on their side. I think it's a matter of what's most convincing. If Abraham Benton hated the church this much in the 1830s, so much so that Joe picked him out of a crowd of dozens of people that hated him to star in his own personal history of the church by name, then this familial connection serves as a weak piece of connective evidence for the pre-1830 Rigdon and Joseph correspondence theory. The connection might not be very strong, and it may require a few steps to get there, but it seems slightly convincing from what I've been able to find in the research of this episode. This is just one of a few connections that bolster the pre-1830 Joe Rigdon connection that we'll be examining today. And it's a very, very small piece of evidence collectively that adds to the theory as a whole. So speaking of what's most convincing and not, that's what we try to focus on here. What's, you know, what's the most convincing model we can construct of early Mormon history? Let's take a step back and look at the model we've constructed surrounding these individuals that persecuted Joseph so far. 
we have Cyrus and David McMaster, who were persecutors of Joe and prosecuting witnesses against him, respectfully. Then we have their in-law connection to Peter Bridgman, who was the first guy that filed a lawsuit against Joe in 1826 on behalf of bossman Josiah Stowell, of whom he was a relative. Next, we have Nathan Boynton, who married into the Stowell family. He was apparently enough of a persecutor that Joe named him out of a group of mob of Mormon haters for what he was doing. And then finally, we have Abraham Benton, with a historically weak connection to the early Mormon church in Ohio through Hingepin Sidney Rigdon months before Rigdon supposedly even knew about the Book of Mormon. So who is the single person at the center of it all? I mean, we talked about it earlier. Well, I mean, Joe was for one thing, because if he wasn't doing what he did at this time, then we wouldn't be talking about this whole thing right now. But I'm more interested in boss man Josiah Stowell. He was the one person with connections to every single person that was listed here that violently despised Joe and wanted to rip him out of his place of manufactured power, just like well, the mob wanted to rip Joe out of the constable's wagon when the wheel conveniently fell off when they were leaving Colesville. Bossman Josiah Stowell was the only person in this group that had any sort of favorable attitude towards Joe. He had originally hired Joe for some treasure seeking. If we remember back to the 1826 trial, Bossman Joe regaled us with a story of treasure digging with Joseph Smith. Apparently, in late 1825, Joe looked in Precious and Mr. Hat in an effort to find treasure for his employer. According to Bossman Joe and Joe himself, he saw treasure buried with a feather in a certain place. The Joe duo went digging late at night in the place that Joe had marked out, and they definitely found something. It was the feather. I mean, no treasure to accompany it, but probably because, you know, the fucking ground numbs had their way with it, but the feather still remained, and they exhumed it from its burial place. And we can look back at that situation nowadays and say that Joe was obviously pulling a fast one on Bossman Joe. They reportedly went at night, so Bossman Joe couldn't tell that the ground had been previously dug up by Joe in order to plant the feather. Well, it was in the wake of this shenanigan that Peter Bridgman, who is Bossman Joe's nephew, filed the 1826 complaint against Joe, which brought him to his first trial that historians are aware of. Bossman Joe obviously wasn't deterred by the findings of this first trial, even though details he gave in his testimony helped to render a guilty verdict against Joe. I mean, Bossman Joe came to Joe's defense in both of the 1830 trials and became the one testimony that got Joe dismissed on the bullshit technicality of the statute of limitations. So, Bossman Joe still considered Joe to be completely legit. What's more, Bossman Joe believed in Joe enough to get baptized into his church in Manchester. It seems like nothing could rip Bossman Joe away from this cancerous parasite that was Joseph Smith. Given the circumstances, I think his fellow Presbyterian friends were concerned with Bossman Joe's well-being and personal finances. The reason I'm harping on this so much is to consider the two sides of the argument that explain the evidence here. It'll take a minute to construct and compare both sides, but I think it's pretty revealing once we hash it all out. First, we have the Mormon perspective of explaining the evidence. They classify all of it as unfounded religious persecution by a rival Jesus faction. They would say that the locals felt threatened by the young prophet and answered that fear with ostracization and abuse. They would say that there were only a select few that actually listened to Joseph Smith and followed his teachings, and the rest opposed it so much that they couldn't help but persecute the prophet for the wonderful work he was bringing forth. Most of them would claim that people violently disagreed with divinely inspired visions of God or Jesus, I mean, let alone both, and wanted to abuse Joseph for claiming such blasphemous things. And this perfectly explains why all the local religious people were trying to get him thrown in jail or just beat him up. And of course, we have the outlier that saw the truth, 
Josiah Stowell. He was the only one in the group that was enlightened enough to see the prophet's true divinity and therefore stuck with him through thick and thin. Now, while that may offer some explanatory power, this explanation has a few holes in it, I'm afraid. First and least importantly, Mormons claim that the first vision in 1820 with God and Jesus floating above Joseph in the forest was a claim that Joe made in the early church and was heavily persecuted for. Well, as we've covered before, this story didn't come out until 1838, long after any of this specific early persecution that we're talking about right now was happening. Even worse, the story didn't reach its current form until sometime after 1838, which is a huge black mark on the veracity of what the story claims. The bigger problem with this divinity claim is the lack of evidence that would be expected. Had Joe been claiming that the current telling was the real story the whole time, I mean, people would have reported a young Joseph Smith claiming to have seen God and Jesus as two separate beings floating above his head in a forest in 1820. Those were pretty radical claims that were a counter to what most people consider Christianity and the Trinity. People reported Joe seeing the angel Moroni in 1823, but the much bigger and more grandiose claim of God and Jesus as two separate corporeal beings dressed in pure white is something that documented history is completely silent on until 1838. Even the people close to Joe, Ollie Cowdung and D-Day David Whitmer, considered this 1820 story fabricated because they hadn't heard of it before the church was organized. Joe just kind of slipped this story into the history to add a false legitimacy after the fact. My point is that people couldn't have been persecuting Joe for this one single radical claim of seeing God and Jesus because he hadn't made it yet. Now on to the more important part of the argument against the Mormon side for explaining the evidence here. I referenced it earlier, but I need to explain it a little deeper. I think Bossman Joe's fellow Presbyterians and family members were worried about his well-being. I mean, let's face it, Joe had swindled Bossman Joe out of wages for treasure hunting a couple of times in a couple of locations. Joe was clever about it, too. I mean, at least he thought he was. Like in the case of Harris Stowell, Bossman Joe's brother. Harris attempted to empirically test Joe by hiding a bag of grain in his own barn and asking Joe to find it. Joe utterly and completely failed and even asked Bossman Joe to give up the location of the bag for a couple of quarters. This was a story told under oath in a court of law. That doesn't make it completely accurate, mind you, but it does lend a fair amount of credibility to the claim. Joe had created a habit of swindling Bossman Joe and, of course, Bossman Joe was a complete sucker for it all. He demonstrated it many times. He bought everything wholesale, hook, line, and sinker, and Joe was able to work him like an anthropomorphic version of Precious. Because, let's face it, that rock had no idea what the fuck Joe was doing, kind of like Bossman Joe didn't. There's an overall point here. Is it likely that... All of Bossman Joe's friends saw what was going on between him and the young charlatan Joe and wanted to save Josiah from the trappings of this prolific hocus-pocus hawking huckster. Put yourself in the shoes of Peter Bridgman or Nathan Boynton or Cyrus McMaster or any other person that was a close friend and fellow churchgoer of Bossman Joe. If you saw one of your friends being bled more and more every day by a parasite like Joseph Smith, wouldn't you do whatever possible to try and save that person, whether legal through a court or extra legal as a mob? I mean, maybe this is why so many people were pushing against the unstoppable consuming fire that was Joseph Smith with such force. So let's compare the two sides of the argument that attempt to explain the evidence. What is more likely? 
Was boss man Josiah Stowell the only person that was righteous and enlightened enough to follow the holy prophet of God in the latter days in establishing the earthly kingdom of God, the one and only Joseph Smith? Meaning every person that was persecuting Joseph Smith was misinformed or compelled to do so by the devil? Or is it more likely that Joe had successfully deceived boss man Joe and every person around him could smell the bullshit and were trying to free boss man Joe from the ravenous clutches of Joe the ignoramus. Which argument really makes the most sense in explaining the evidence? I suppose you can probably see through the bias that I've built into the script in constructing this argument, so I'll try and remove my bias and let you judge for yourself. Consider my argument with its bias and then check out the link in the show notes. It's a link to the Fair Mormon blog with the article that I took the Mormon side of this argument from. For anybody that isn't aware by this point, Fair Mormon is a volunteer-based Mormon apologist website. You can look up pretty much any topic that challenges Mormon history and find out an apologist's answer to the fact. I encourage anybody that's in pursuit of genuine knowledge beyond what I present to look at this article and judge my argument against what's argued on this website and see which argument holds up to simple logic. Seriously, please look it up. If I fucked up my logic somehow, please let me know. I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. So, Joe's two trials aside here, what happened next with the church? Well, it's something pretty special for a couple of reasons. Joe gave his first revelation that would eventually be included in the pricey Pearl of Great Price. In late June of 1830, Joe revealed the Book of Moses. This was in the wake of the trials, and I honestly think that Joe was trying to restore some credibility somehow. So, he provided revelation of a new perspective on the story of Moses— given from the first-person perspective of God himself. This was interesting because it isn't written in the format that the Bible is written in. Specifically, the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, were supposedly written by Moses himself, and they use a very unique style. This, of course, is presupposing that Moses was indeed a real person, which evidence points to that being the wrong presumption. Regardless of how the Bible is written, Joe had to bring about Bible 2.0 and write things in a whole new way. That's how you could tell he was a legitimate prophet of God, of course. He brought new perspective to the same old shitbags that were Yahweh and Jehovah. Joe revealed this, as he did with all his revelations, from God's perspective. This was fairly unique at the time. Not many people, even in the Jesus knob gobbling burned over district, were bold enough to do some crazy shit like this. Joe was a pioneer when it came to premium, platinum level grade A bullshit. I'll just read a few verses from this to get an idea of what the entire thing is like. If anybody wants to hear the passage in its entirety, check out my Book of Mormon podcast episode 83. This is from the very first chapter in the Book of Moses. Quote, And behold, thou art my son. Wherefore, look, and I will show thee the workmanship of mine hands, but not all. For my works are without end, and also my words, for they never cease. Wherefore, no man can behold all my works, except he behold all my glory, and no man can behold all my glory, and afterwards remain in the flesh on the earth. And I have a work for thee, Moses, my son, and thou art in the similitude of mine only begotten, and mine only begotten is and shall be the Savior, for he is full of grace and truth, but there is no God beside me, and all things are present with me, for I know them all. End quote. What a douchebag, right? I mean, just a little side note, I find it interesting that Joe revealed everything from God's perspective, using I's and me's and my's. 
I suppose it's, I mean, somewhat internally consistent. I mean, Joe being the mouthpiece of God and whatnot. But when you take a step back, the irony tends to strike quite hard. What I'm referring to is the commandment of thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. This is a commandment that's been left up to interpretation since being recorded as part of the Mosaic Law. A lot of Bible scholars would argue that it had something to do with cursing God or cursing someone in the name of God, but the more important thing that makes it ironic in the Mormon religion is how it's interpreted by Mormons. They consider swearing in the name of God to be taking the Lord's name in vain. Phrases like, oh my God, are strictly forbidden by true believing Mormons. Saying something like that is the quickest way to offend a Mormon. Of course, if you expound on it, it just adds to the degrees of condemnation. Phrases like, Jesus H. Diddy fucking Christ, or Holy Mother of God, or Holy fucking goddamn dog shit, or God fucking damn it, or Goodness gracious, God's great balls will fuck you over fire, or I mean, anything like that. I mean, I mean the reason I bring this up is to comment on the irony alone. When you're talking about taking the Lord's name in vain, biblically speaking, it's very different from what we consider veining today. The ancient Hebrews didn't say, oh my Yahweh, or Yahweh H. Titty fucking Jesus, or whatever. I mean, that's a fairly modern phrase. What they considered to be taking the Lord's name in vain was claiming that you're speaking for God when you actually aren't. That's the reason that this commandment is couched in a list of three other commandments about having no other gods before Yahweh and the Lord being a jealous God. This is even reflected in the New Testament in Luke 9. I mean, Jesus and his disciples are walking and happen upon a person that's casting out demons in Jesus' name. John the Beloved tries to stop the guy because he is speaking for Jesus and taking his name in vain by trying to banish these demons. Then Jesus answers with the platitude of, quote, do not stop him, for anybody that is not against us is for us, end quote. Remember, this was a group of Jews walking around that were observing the ancient Levitical laws, of which the Ten Commandments were part of. That was the sticking point, and why John tried to stop this guy. He was taking Jesus' name in vain, by trying to use it to cast out demons. That is what's meant by taking the Lord's name in vain in the biblical perspective. Mormons have it all wrong and don't understand the biblical perspective. The Mormon understanding is completely missing the point that the Bible is trying to make with that commandment. That being said, let's talk about Joe's revelations. He wasn't just acting in the name of God falsely, he was claiming divine providence by being a conduit for God. Joe was claiming to literally speak for God himself and gave his revelations in the perspective of God saying, I and me and my. This isn't some hidden thing in the church. The prophet of the church is often called the mouthpiece of God for this very reason. What could possibly be considered more, taking the Lord's name in vain, than falsely speaking for God or giving a so-called divine revelation from the perspective of God? Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon religion, is responsible for the largest violation of this commandment since the prophet Muhammad, in my opinion. Many others have claimed that they had a connection to God or they had some kind of insight into the mind of God, but few have ever claimed that they were speaking as a God himself. This is the absolute height of blasphemy, all things considered. None of the phrases that I said before were anywhere near as offensive as anything that Joe said. I mean, I was just saying words with God at the beginning, middle, or end. Joe was speaking as God himself, or revealing scripture from the first-person perspective of God. Let's try to empathize with God here. Put yourself in God's shoes. What's more offensive? I'll be using the word listener here, but just insert your own name here to help illustrate the point. Listener fucking damn it, or list titty fucking her, or is somebody saying... 
quote, listener spoke unto Moses, saying, Behold, I am the listener almighty, and endless is my name, for I am without beginning of days or end of years, and is not this endless, end quote. I mean, what is truly more offensive to you as the God that created these beings? Picture this from God's perspective. You create the heavens, the earth, the universe, the cosmos, the primordial soup that all life evolved from on earth, and the one of those pathetic little creatures puts words in your mouth or claims to be speaking as you from your perspective? In the Judeo-Christian belief, what is truly more offensive? What is actually considered to be more blasphemous? I personally would argue that speaking for God is way more offensive to God than just swearing using the word God. All of this just illustrates how wrong Mormons have it. It tells you just how much Joe and the current LDS church misunderstand the commandment of taking the Lord's name in vain and the Bible as a whole for that matter. I mean, this was all just a small aside about shit that's offensive to believing being Mormons, so let's get back into the timeline. At this point, people were kind of down on Joe since his two arrests and trials, wherein he narrowly escaped conviction. Joe had to do something that would resurrect just how genuine his divine revelations were, so he revealed this chapter of Moses that would later be included in the Price of Pearl. After Joe gave this revelation, he and Ali Kaudong all over made another attempt to go to Colesville and baptize the people that said that they were willing and properly organize the church over there. Until this time, the Knights and a couple of other people had just been meeting in the Knights' house, and that was considered the Colesville congregation of the church. Of course, when Joe and Ollie got there, they were just chased out and then fled to Harmony, Pennsylvania. At this point, Joe effectively swore off that congregation and just had to dictate his directions by mail or messenger for his own safety. If Joe ever set foot back in Colesville again, he would either be drug out onto the streets and beaten or just straight up lynched. So for some reason, he was a little afraid of the people of Colesville, and I don't really blame him, from his perspective anyway. But it all stands to reason. The people felt wronged by what Joe had done and was doing at the time, and they had already tried by legal means to get satisfaction for his fraudulent practices. Once Joe escaped on the technicalities, the people would probably demand satisfaction by any means necessary because the legal system had failed them. So... Joe and Ollie go hang out at the Hale and Laws in Harmony, living in the house that Joe was attempting to purchase from his father-in-law, Isaac Hale. It had just ticked into July of 1830, and Joe received a few more revelations from God about what was going on and what they were supposed to do next. I'll just read a few excerpts from these revelations. They comprise the Book of Commandments, chapter 25, 26, and 27. And there are a few things in here to focus on that set Joe up for the rest of his life in the church. Starting with chapter 25, quote, Behold, thou wast called and chosen to write the Book of Mormon. And I have lifted thee up out of thine afflictions, and have counseled thee, and thou hast been delivered from all thine enemies, and thou hast been delivered from the powers of Satan and from darkness. Nevertheless, thou art not excusable in thy transgressions. Nevertheless, go thy way and sin no more. Magnify thine office. End quote. The passage we just read was a pretty standard procedure when it came to Joe's revelations. Basically, Joe ascribes their narrow misses in the past with the legal system as given to them by God, and then God tells Joe that he's not under any condemnation for his sins somehow, but that he should go forth and sin no more. This is like the third time we've read those exact words on this show, and I'll just reiterate my argument with a very simple question. If Joe was indeed the pious young prophet he claimed to be, 
Why would God need to continually excuse him for his sins or tell him over and over again to go forward and sin no more like the woman caught in adultery by the scribes and Pharisees in John 8? Obviously, Joe wasn't as clean from sin as the current day church seems to report, so much so that Joe had to consistently tell everybody that God forgave him for his transgressions at the beginning of a bunch of his revelations. We're really starting to see the beginning phase of Joe's revelations morphing from problem-solving into self-serving problem-solving. Let's continue on a little later in that same chapter in the Book of Commandments. It seems to reveal a lot about Joe's personality. Starting on verse 10 from chapter 25, quote, For thou shalt devote all thy service in Zion, and in this thou shalt have strength. Be patient in afflictions, for thou shalt have many, but endure them, for lo, I am with you, even unto the end of thy days. And in temporal labors thou shalt not have strength, for this is not thy calling. Attend to thy calling, and thou shalt have wherewith to magnify thine office and to expound all scriptures. End quote. This is one extremely telling passage when we try to peer through the text into the window of Joe's mind. Basically, Joe said that his office and calling are to work in the church, and in this he shall have strength. I keep reiterating this, but remember, this is Joe speaking as the only living mouthpiece for the almighty God of the universe. After he said that he would have strength for working in the church, he says that, quote, in temporal labors, thou shalt not have strength, for this is not thy calling, end quote. What a pompous jackass, right? I mean, Basically, he gave revelation from God that he's supposed to work on the church only and that he wouldn't be able to do temporal labors because they aren't his calling. All right, I get where he's coming from. When you take on a project like starting a church or trying to create, edit, and produce a podcast of the history of said church, it's a lot easier to focus on that one thing when you don't have a day job. Joe was able to swear off all physical labor for money and to tell everybody that his church was to be his one and only focus. Bravo, really. I mean, the only people around that he was revealing this to were the Hales, his wife Emma, and Ollie Kaudong and John Whitmer. But it was printed as part of the commandments of the church, given as revelation from Joe, and it would forever be cemented into the annals of church history. That was one momentous revelation by Joe. However, the best part comes up in the next part of the passage. Joe starts aiming the revelation at Ollie, and some of the shit that he says might just blow your mind. Growing up Mormon, I never knew that Mormons had some of the powers that Joe was about to list out for Ollie. Verse 10 in chapter 27, quote, And thy brother Oliver shall continue in bearing my name before the world and also to the church, and he shall not suppose that he can say enough in my cause, and lo, I am with him to the end. In me he shall have glory, and not of himself, whether in weakness or in strength, whether in bonds or free. And at all times and in all places he shall open his mouth and declare my gospel, as with the voice of a trump, both day and night. And I will give unto him strength, such as is not known among men." Require not miracles, except I shall command you, except casting out devils, healing the sick, and against poisonous serpents, and against deadly poisons. End quote. <laughs> That's right. The church that Joe created that uses the Doctrine and Covenants as its compilation of holy revelations is a snake-handling, poison-drinking death cult. How fucked up is that? 
I mean, I know that the church is big on healings with priesthood blessings that use anointing oil and whatnot, but when has anybody in the LDS church been bit by a venomous snake or drank poison and wasn't hurt by it? I fucking love how this is never talked about in the church. It's right here in the Doctrine and Covenants, and it's completely and outrageously stupid. I mean, like post-thrown monkey shit sliding down the wall, stupid. Really, really goddamn dumb. So now that Joe gave Ollie superpowers <laughs> that supposedly every true Christian has, according to the Bible, Joe turned his focus to the real-world problems of the precarious situation he just made for himself. What I'm referring to is that lack of income to survive off of. Joe wasn't bringing in the big bucks like he thought he would with selling the Book of Mormon. Back then, selling a couple copies per day at $1.75 a piece would be enough to sustain Joe and Emma just fine, and I mean, possibly even his closest cabinet members in the church. Well, they weren't even able to sell that many, and the investment fund that Martin Harris put forward was drying up. I mean, especially because of Not So Smarty Marty. I mean, of course, he dropped the three grand to publish the book, and he was probably a bit concerned with getting paid back. He was probably taking half of the profits from every book sale to try and chew away at the massive debt he had incurred. If they were able to sell every one of the 5,000 copies at the $1.75 that Joe initially set out, they would be made in the shade with an extra $5,700 to split up as profit or reinvestment back into the church, you would hope. Well, hardly any of the books of Mormon were selling, and Joe was desperate for money to live on. Emma was probably badgering him as well to do something about their lack of money. I mean, I can only imagine how stressed she must have been with the situation. Well, the last few verses of section 25 and the first few verses of the following section help to take care of that little problem. Starting with verse 18, quote, And thou shalt take no purse, nor scrip, neither staves, neither two coats. For the church shall give unto thee in the very hour what thou needest for food and for raiment, and for shoes, and for money, and for scrip. For thou art called to prune my vineyard with a mighty pruning, yea, even for the last time, yea, and also all those whom thou hast ordained, and they shall do even according to this pattern. Amen. Now on to section 26, quote, Emma, my daughter in Zion, a revelation I give unto you concerning my will. Behold, thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou art an elect lady whom I have called. Murmur not because of the things which thou hast not seen, for they are withheld from thee and from the world, which is wisdom in me in a time to come. And the office of thy calling shall be for a comfort unto my servant Joseph, thy husband, in his afflictions with consoling words in the spirit of meekness. And thou shalt go with him at the time of his going, and be unto him for a scribe, that I may send Oliver whithersoever I will. Jumping down to verse 8. And thou needest not fear, for thy husband shall support Support thee from the church. End quote. From then on, the leadership of the church would be supported by the church. And somehow, that same doctrine has inflated to Boyd K. Packer having more than $1.6 million in real estate holdings in the Salt Lake Valley before Mormon Satan dragged him back home. I'm not sure where to draw the line between a person being supported by the church or making money off of the church. But I think the current leadership of the LDS church found that line and fucking nuked the shit out of it a long time ago. So let's talk about what the heart of this revelation was, as opposed to the small details. Basically, Joe was setting up the leadership as it best served him, or the church leadership at that point. 
Before these revelations, the primary scribe of the church was Ollie. Well, Joe needed somebody with some authority to go to Colesville to baptize the newcomers, and any time Joe would go there with Ollie, they would barely escape with their lives thanks to the mob. So, Joe decided to alleviate the problem by not going and sending Ollie as his proxy. The problem with sending Ollie away was the fact that Joe no longer had his second-in-command right by his side, helping with usual church duties or being his scribe, and subsequently, he couldn't keep an eye on Ollie and everything he was doing. So, Joe called Emma to repentance and gave her the calling of being the church scribe. John Whitmer was there in the midst of all this as well. I mean, Joe gives him a very weird revelation. The content itself isn't really that weird, but there's a small detail in it that's easy to overlook. The revelation is two verses, and it reads as follows. Starting in Book of Commandments, section 27, verse 1. Quote, Behold, I say unto you, that you shall let your time be devoted to the studying of the scriptures, and to preaching, and to confirming the church at Colesville, and to performing your labors on the land, such as is required, until after you shall go to the west to hold the next conference, and then it shall be made known what you shall do. End quote. Follow me for a second here, because the detail I want to focus on is, quote, to the west, end quote that was revealed in that verse. It was saying that the next conference that they would have would be held in the West, and that would be where John Whitmer would receive further instructions on his calling in the church. I find it interesting that Joe would refer to the next place as the West. When you look at a map of the New York, Palmyra, Ohio area, and put a pin in Colesville where Joe was sending Ollie and John, it is the furthest, most east destination that the church would deal with for a little while. So the connection I'm about to draw might not have any foundation, or I might just be reading too deeply into things when focusing on the phrase of to the west. This is something that's in line with the Solomon Spaulding authorship theory, or at least the pre-1830 Rigdon and Joe connection. It has to do with positing the claim that Sidney Rigdon and Joseph Smith had been planning for a long time to convert the congregants of Rigdon's mentor Ohio Church to Mormonism, long before it's recorded in the church history that Kingpin Rigdon and Joe met. When Joe says that the next conference would be held to the West, he could have been implying Ohio. The next conference ended up being held in Fayette, which is really north of Colesville and only slightly west, but it's much, much more north. Also, the Manchester-Palmyra area is a fair amount of distance almost directly west of Fayette. So, Fayette wasn't the westernmost piece that Joe was talking about when he said west. It's kind of odd that he told John Whitmer that the next place he would get instructions for his calling was to the west as opposed to to the north, like he would be implying Fayette. This is made even more odd by the fact that Joe gave this revelation when they were all in Harmony, Pennsylvania, the westernmost city they had been in up to this point. If Joe was saying that the next revelation would come in Fayette, why wouldn't he say to the north or east, which is where all of those towns are in comparison to Harmony even today? where he was giving this revelation in the first place. He said to the West when they weren't aware of anything that was going on west of Harmony. I mean, in the recorded church history, but that's only if you believe what the church's recorded history says. However, if Joe and Hingepin Rigdon had been planning to merge long before this, Joe could say to the West as some kind of prophecy of the mentor church joining up with them, that the next conference would be to the direct west of all the towns they had been working in since. That could mean Ohio. 
I mean, Mentor, Ohio is directly west of Harmony, and it would make sense that if Joe and Rigdon were finally bringing their plan together, that Joe would be making subtle allusions to it, or at least mentioning it. But like I said, I might just be reading into this too much, and the to the west could just be implying the second most eastern town, meaning Fayette, that they were working in when Joe said it, because that's where the next conference was held. I mean, there isn't really any way of knowing what Joe meant by the West for sure, but it's still fun to kind of speculate on these small details that seem to bolster the claim that Joe and Rigdon knew each other long before the Book of Mormon ever went to print. All right, my personal speculations aside, let's talk about what happened next with Joe and friends. Well, they sort of had a, uh, one might say, rough patch. In order to understand this, I'll have to introduce all Nevermos to the term priestcraft. This is a word that I thought was a word for a long time until I heard David Michael on my Book of Mormon podcast come across it and not have any idea what the fuck priestcraft was. I wasn't even aware that it was Mormonese alone. Well, the actual definition of it in the term is nothing. I mean, it's not a real word. The two words separated, priest and craft, next to each other means the craft or practice that a priest engages in. However, the Mormonese definition puts it as somebody that is paid for working for the church. This is 2 Nephi from the Book of Mormon, chapter 26, verse 29 and 31. Quote, He commanded that there shall be no priest crafts, for, behold, Priestcrafts are that men preach and set themselves up for a light unto the world, that they may get gain and praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. But the laborer in Zion shall labor for Zion, for if they labor for money, they shall perish. End quote. What's so weird about this is, if we look at the church today, There really is no getting around the fact that they have long since overcome this little hiccup of a revelation and they pay their full-time clergy a stipend to live off of. Plus, they have an entire building in Salt Lake City. Not just a building, but the tallest skyscraper in Salt Lake City that's the church's office building. Full of people that are, quote, laboring for Zion, end quote, and they are all paid a wage for what they do. Beyond that, the church pays their seminary teachers for teaching high school kids about church during school hours. Beyond the seminary teachers, every person in the leadership of the Twelve Apostles and the First Presidency is paid stupendous amounts of money for essentially being a full-time priest of the church. The way they amassed such ungodly amounts of wealth, like BKP having $1.6 million in real estate holdings before he died, is of course by being a chairman of a specific board of the for-profit arm of the church. Then they'll take massive tax-deductible donations for like giving a speech at a school or some kind of conference in various parts of the world. Basically, there is absolutely no way to skirt this fact that there are thousands of people on the church payroll that directly violate this unambiguous commandment from the Book of Mormon, 2 Nephi chapter 26. A lot of people would say that the living stipends they receive aren't actually considered pay, but when you step back and look at it, they are making a living and they're working for the church full time. Nothing could be closer to this definition of priestcraft than what the church does for itself today. Honestly, I mean, personally, I don't necessarily have a problem with it on a fundamental level. I mean, we all have to have money to live on. And if people are devouting a full-time job's worth of time to an organization, they should be compensated for doing so. I only really have a problem 
when they take that money that was given to them by a tax-free donation basis only, and they live in their home that they don't have to pay property taxes on, and they deduct their mileage to and from the church, and they work in a building that's on a multi-acre plot, usually in prime real estate in the center of town, that property taxes are not collected on, and they can all do this without having to be transparent whatsoever with anybody, including the IRS, with their expenditures even though they are supposed to be for the good of the community. And even saying that, I don't take into account the frustration that they're selling an invisible, baseless, testless, materialist product in the first place in order to collect all that tax-free money. But when it all boils down to the core, I don't have much of a problem with clergy members receiving a living stipend for their work. I mean, they shouldn't get rich for it, of course, but they should be able to survive in the real world. Where I draw the line with the LDS Church is the fact that priestcraft is against their canon and doctrine in multiple places, and yet they still do it. Even more so than that, they still somehow claim to have an unpaid clergy, which at this point is just bold-faced lying when you boil it down like I did earlier. Hypocrisy, thy name is discipleship. Well, unfortunately, I have just as much of a problem with the hypocrisy here as Ollie Cowdung all over had. Soon after Joe gave his revelations that we just read to Ollie, Emma, and John Whitmer, Ollie left and made his way to the Whitmers in Fayette. This marks the official first dissension in the church, and it was orchestrated by Oliver Cowdery. Ollie was more of a scholar on the Book of Mormon than Joe was, I mean, having written it down twice, once during Joe's dictation and once to create the printer's manuscript. Ollie knew that priestcraft, as Mormons perceive it, was in direct conflict with the Book of Mormon, and Ollie knew that Joe had given faulty revelations before. One example of some of these faulty revelations would be in relation to the trips to Canada to sell the copyright of the Book of Mormon. Check out episode 20 of this show for all the details on that. Well, Joe sent Ollie to Fayette with the revelations we just read that told Joe to take what he needs to survive from the church, and that Joe would be able to support Emma through the support of the church. Well, Ollie really didn't like this too much and considered it a faulty revelation, just like the ones about the trips to Canada. This was during mid to late July that this all happened. Well, Joe received a letter from Ollie that had some real bite to it. Unfortunately, this letter is no longer extant. But we can read what Joe said about it and what he did to remedy the situation from the History of the Church, Volume 1. Quote, subtitled, Cowdery's Error. Whilst thus employed in the work appointed me by Heavenly Father, I received a letter from Oliver Cowdery, the contents of which gave me both sorrow and uneasiness. Not having that letter now in my possession, I cannot, of course, give it in full here, but merely an extract of the most prominent parts, which I can yet and expect long to remember." He wrote to inform me that he had discovered an error in one of the commandments. This is quoting from the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, quote, And truly manifest by their works that they have received of the Spirit of Christ unto a remission of their sins, end quote. Back to quoting History of the Church, quote, The above quotation, he said, was erroneous and added, I command you in the name of God to erase those words that no priestcraft be among us. That was quoting Oliver. I immediately wrote him in reply, in which I asked him by what authority he took upon him to command me to alter or erase to add to or diminish from a revelation or commandment from Almighty God, end quote. All right, so what happened here and why does it matter? 
Those are two very important questions. Joe had given the revelation that he and Emma would be supported by the church, and Ollie knew that it was in direct conflict with the Book of Mormon and what the church had been teaching up to that point. Then, Ollie Cowdung threw some bullshit at the situation and commanded Joe in the name of God to change the revelation to comport with the teachings of the church up to this point, or with the Book of Mormon itself. Joe fired back a letter asking Ollie who the fuck he thought he was, stating that Joe was the one guy responsible for the revelations from God, and anything that comes from Joe is obviously the only real word of God. Last episode, I described one reason why I like old Orin Pistol Pack and Porter Rockwell much more than I like Ollie Cowdung all over Cowdery is because he actually had a spine, and Joe couldn't control old Port like he could Ollie. This is a perfect example of Joe giving revelation to trump Ollie's revelation just to break Ollie's spirit and force him to submit to Joe's will. I think it's a bit apparent to see that Joe was a little threatened by Ollie at this point. His neck was exposed. I mean, it's not too hard to imagine anyway. Ollie had been with Joe since the beginning of this whole Book of Mormon shenanigan, basically, and he saw through the false prophet facade that Joe was constructing for his followers to worship. I mean, the first revelation that was read to the April 11th congregation of the church was actually given originally by Ollie. That's right, the sermon that Ollie gave started off with preaching from Ezekiel 14 and then read not Joe's, but Ollie's revelation concerning the organization of the church. That's found in present day Doctrine and Covenants 20. I think at this point, Ollie didn't necessarily see Joe as his superior. I think there might have been a bit of infighting between them, but we can only surmise out from what we can read. That could help to explain all the revelations that Joe gave Ollie to, like, beware of pride and repent for your pride and wickedness. Joe was trying to set himself above Ollie, and Ollie wouldn't have it especially once he discovered a clear and blatant discrepancy in the doctrine, like he did with the whole priestcrafting thing that we talked about earlier. You almost wonder if Ollie might have thought that he would be a better person to run the show than Joe was. That's made abundantly clear in 1838 when he got excommunicated and goes off to form the community of Christ, but you do tend to wonder if he was having those same thoughts eight years before he left, where our timeline currently sits. That's what I like to think about. It's all about the human element. If we try and look at these historical events without the human element in place, things don't always tend to make sense. But when we consider the possibility that Ollie was competing for top dog because he thought he would be a better prophet of the church than Joe a lot of interesting variables get added in, and explanations for evidence as well. And honestly, before this, Joe hadn't done anything that explicitly smacked down Ollie for his subversion of Joe's authority. Like I said earlier, Joe had told Ollie to beware of pride or repent, but never before had he been so direct. I mean, at times, Joe nurtured Ollie's attempts to be a prophet, Ollie tried translating some of the plates himself, which this translation is no longer extant. Uh, Ollie was the first preacher of the church in the April 6th and 11th congregations, and he gave the first sermons in the church. Ollie's revelation was the first revelation read to the people in the first two congregations of the church, that's Doctrine and Covenants 20, and we owe most of the current organization of the male roles in the church to Ollie's revelation of the power structure in D&C 20. Joe had Ollie do all of the baptisms and confirmations up to this point. Are we starting to see why Ollie might have thought he was in charge, as opposed to just following Joe blindly like he's portrayed in current Mormon history? I mean, before moving on to Joe's solution of Ollie's subversive reaction to Joe's revelations, we need to talk about the last line that was just read out of the history of the church. I have a bit of a problem with it, and I would hope that it's quite clear why. 
without me having to make much of a case for it. When Ollie had written this scathing letter to Joe, Joe's reply letter had the line, quote, by what authority he, meaning Ollie, took upon him to command me, meaning Joe, to alter or erase, to add to or diminish from a revelation or commandment from the almighty God, end quote. What the fuck is this? I know for a fact that the church claims anything the current prophet reveals supersedes anything in the past, but that just means the church doctrine is kind of like the U.S. Constitution. I mean, amendments can be added to the Bill of Rights, even to the point that one amendment can override others. However, the amendments can't be changed willy-nilly, nor can the Constitution itself. But in this example, Joe was offended that he gave revelation from the Almighty God, in his words, and all he was demanding that Joe change it to be in accordance with what the church really believes and what's said in the Book of Mormon. How many times do I have to reiterate the millions of changes in the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants collectively that the church has quietly performed to make them more concordant with reality in the 180 years they've been going. The church changes the wording in the Book of Mormon every few words like clockwork. The most current revision was published in 2013, but they told Mormons not to worry, of course, because this revision didn't change anything fundamentally, nor did the page numbers change at all. So they just didn't even need to buy new books of Mormon. In researching the differences between the 1833 Book of Commandments as opposed to the current version of the Doctrine and Covenants that's posted on the LDS.org website, there really is no place to start. Entire sections are massively altered, wording is bastardized, sections are made longer or shorter or given more or less verses depending on what fits the best. The differences are probably innumerable. What the fuck would Joe possibly think if he were to read the current publication of the church canon, as opposed to what he revealed and recorded? Given how angry Joe was at Ollie's God-commanded threat, one could probably shut down every coal fire power plant in America today if we were somehow able to harness the power of Joe perpetually turning over in his grave for what today's church has done to Joe's original revelations. And think of yourself in Joe's position. If you had given divine revelation from the Almighty God, would you allow people to change it here and there just to best suit their endgame? No, fuck that. It would piss you off, and you would do something about it, much like Joe did in this situation. Let's finish out this episode by reading Joe's recorded response to this chiding letter from Ollie. Quote, this is subtitled, The Prophet's Correction of the Error referring to Ollie's error, that was the subtitle of the previous section. A few days afterwards, I visited him and Mr. Whitmer's family, meaning Ollie, when I found the family in general of his opinion concerning the words above quoted, and it was not without both labor and perseverance that I could prevail with any of them to reason calmly on the subject. However, Christian Whitmer at length became convinced that the sentence was reasonable and according to the scripture, and finally, with his assistance, I succeeded in bringing not only the Whitmer family, but also Oliver Cowdery to acknowledge that they had been in error and that the sentence in dispute was in accordance with the rest of the commandment, and thus was this error rooted out which having its rise in presumption and rash judgment was the more particularly calculated, when once fairly understood, to teach each and all of us the necessity of humility and meekness before the Lord, that he might teach us of his ways, that we might walk in his paths and live by every word that proceedeth forth from his mouth." What a premium douchebag, right? 
I mean, Ollie was expressing dissent or some kind of disagreement with Joe's revelation. So Joe made a trip from Harmony up to Fayette, a journey of almost 300 miles, in order to correct the disagreement or squash the insurrection. And to be honest, rightly so. If Joe would have just ignored the problem, Ollie and the Whitmer family would have fallen away right at that moment, as opposed to doing so on defection day eight years after this. When Joe got to the Whitmer home, he found that everybody agreed with Ollie, and they all considered Joe a false prophet by this point. I'm not sure if I've made this point before, but I think Ollie was fairly eloquent in his ability to argue with people or present his case. I mean, we know that he was one of the smarter of the group, probably not as cunning or vindictive as Joe, but at least as smart, and had definitely read much more than Joe had. Well, we don't know exactly what was said or what the mood was among Ollie and the Whitmers from when Ollie sent the letter until Joe got there in person to defend himself, but I would be willing to place my bets on the scenario that Ollie had established himself as the true leader of the church, given everything leading up to this point and this discrepancy in the doctrine that he supposedly found. I bet that he was telling the Whitmers that if Joe was coming up with contradictory revelations or revelations that weren't coming true, he couldn't be trusted as the leader anymore. That sentiment seemed a little bit conveyed with the portion that Joe recounted of the letter that Oliver sent. Besides, I mean, most of the Whitmers had seen the revelations that Joe gave with instructions to sell the copyright in Canada that... Of course, failed miserably. So, in their minds, Joe was batting a pretty low average at this point. If Ollie was able to take his own revelation of the organization of the church and couple that with the Book of Mormon, those things alone would be able to establish Ollie as the new leader of the church and could push Joe into obscurity because of his own lying. Well, this is just speculation of what was said, but I don't think it's unfounded. I mean, the Whitmers had given themselves to the Mormon religion and had accepted the Book of Mormon as the new, new testament of Jesus Christ in America. Would it be easier for them to just swear the whole thing off when contradictions came up? Or would it be more likely that they would just follow the next person in line that says they have the truth that's only slightly different from what they had accepted as truth so far? You know, Ollie substituting himself as Joe. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, just by reading into the human element of what Joe said in his recounting of the situation, I think we can come to an understanding that the Whitmers were ready to follow the new prophet and president of the church, Ollie Cowdrung all over Cowdery, and leave Joe to do his own thing with his own church. Well, Joe wouldn't let this subversion orchestrated by Ollie do him in. At least not without a proper theologically combative argument. Joe tells this with the line, quote, When I found the family in general of his, meaning Ollie's, opinion, Concerning the words above quoted, and it was not without both labor and perseverance that I could prevail with any of them to reason calmly on the subject. End quote. Basically, Joe tried to convince anybody that he was too for real, and they would just argue with him about it. Ollie had obviously done some serious work on these people, if they all opposed Joe to the point that they wouldn't easily be coaxed back to the Joe side of early Mormonism. Like I said, it's all about the human element that's buried deep in the history itself. Ollie was a convincing debater, and he was able to convince people to easily side with him. I mean, why else would Joe send Ollie on the most important missions? He tasked Ollie with convincing or baptizing some of the higher-value targets that would later become big movers in the church. Joe revered Ollie when they were on the same side. However, when Ollie and Joe did occasionally lock horns, they were each other's greatest foes. And we see that happening replete throughout the Mormon history. 
The only way that Joe was able to prevail in this situation was by going after the weakest one in the herd, Christian Whitmer. He was the eldest siblings of all the Whitmers, born in 1798, but for some reason, he was the crack in the foundation of the wall that Ollie had constructed to keep Joe out. But, of course, Joe being as adaptive as water to a weak foundation was able to slip in and chip away at that foundation until it all crumbled, and the Whitmer family and Ollie were all convinced of Joe's claims of being a prophet once again. Joe was somehow able to reconcile the blatant contradiction between the Book of Mormon and the revelation he had just given concerning this Mormonese term of priestcraft, and everybody somehow bought it, and they just lived happily ever after. Well, for a little while anyway. At least, they did until Hiram Page tried to give his own revelation using his own seer stone in his own hat. That was the next fire that Joe had to put out, and it's a story we'll open up next historical episode with. But for now, we can see how intelligent and adaptive Joe was by inserting the human element into the few paragraphs of the history of the church that we read today. In simple conversations, I've been asked before, if you could have one conversation with somebody from antiquity, who would it be? That's always a hard one, and the answer tends to differ with whatever it is I'm studying at the time. I've often answered with some amazing warlord like Alexander the Great or Adolf Hitler. Other times I would like to meet an intellectual hermit like Archimedes or Nikola Tesla. I suppose the answer isn't ever set in stone because it's all hypothetical anyway, so today I can honestly answer that question invariably with the name Oliver Cowdery. Cowdery was a person that was like no other. He's one of the closest people to the prophet for the most formative years of the church. He was responsible for some of the biggest insurrections throughout the entirety of church history. And to top it all off, the RLDS church today has him to thank for defecting when he did and not allowing himself to join in on the child-fucking ring of polygamy that later became the Nauvoo and Salt Lake City LDS churches. Oliver Cowdery was a smart motherfucker, and I think he knew what he wanted in life. He was a crusader for truth, no matter how delusional that truth was that he was studying. He didn't have a problem standing up to Joe in some situations, and he had the intellect sharp enough to defend his actions and beliefs. If I could go back and have a conversation with anybody from the early Mormon church, aside from the prophet himself, of course, I would instantly choose Oliver Cowdery just to find out what kind of person he really was. But, until Google puts the final touches on time travel, I suppose I'll just have to get by with speculation on this dynamic and exciting individual based on whatever we can read about him. I'm really excited to see what happens in the near future with our buddy Elder Oliver Cowdery, Ollie Cowdong all over. Alright, that does it for the history portion of this episode. Let's move on to listener mail. Got a message from Jessica. Um, She sent an email last episode, of which I uh, replied to. She kind of threw out a lot of things there, but one thing that I wanted to focus on was um, she started her final paragraph with this quote a rabbit hole you could delve into is john c bennett apparently he performed abortions on behalf of one joseph smith i'm currently doing a lot of research on that myself um i am awfully interested in what you might find out about that because i've heard of this before and i know that john c bennett was one of the um one of the close guys you might want to you might call him a cabinet member of Joseph's church um, for quite a while, and he was kind of rogue and cavalier with a lot of the polygamies that he did because uh, he kind of had the idea that you know, hey, I'm I'm a doctor, so you know, if you have a baby by me, then we don't have to keep it. So he did a lot of abortions for himself, as uh, pharma as I'm aware, but 
I wasn't aware that he did any on behalf of Joseph. So, Jessica, if you end up finding anything about that, I would be really, really interested in hearing what you have to say or chasing some of the links that you've found in um, (laughs) your research of this topic. So, thanks for the heads up and thanks for sending in the email. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Also got an email from Michael. Um, He just wrote in to voice his support of the Boyd K. Packer episode. I don't want to harp on that. But um, he also sent in his uh, story, his transition out of the church, basically, which he says that um, while I know my story isn't completely unique, I wanted to share it briefly. I still find myself struggling with biases that I was raised with that I've slowly shed over time, and I continue to struggle with more that I haven't realized I still have in the future. Um, uh, Michael, I appreciate you sending that in because that is what's really, really important. I am able to draw a lot of motivation from people sending in their their stories of transitioning out of the Mormon church. When people say that they heard an argument or that they, you know they started questioning or they um, came out when they were a teenager or during their mission or whatever, people have sent me in a lot of these messages. It just helps me to... Um, I don't know how to say this, but like it helps to verify or it it helps to add validity to what I'm doing here because sometimes I get locked into this self-defeating downward spiral that I'm like, why am I doing this show? Why am I putting so many hours into this show? And then I get a message from somebody like you, Michael, telling me about um, how much you are enjoying the show and appreciate it and telling me about your transition. And it's just so motivating to hear the hear of people coming out of the church and finding their way out because I'm like, oh man, there's, there's people out there that are interested in what's here. It's, there's people that need it to understand that the things that I understand about the church. And that's what I want to provide. So Michael, thank you so much for sending in this email. It's just a huge motivating factor with uh, perpetuating the show. It helps me, it helps to uh, engender a bit of motivation for me to keep on going with it. So thank you very much for sending that in. Got an email from Jay, a good old Jay that we had a special edition discussion episode with and sent me the five volume set of the early Mormon documents and also sent the history of the church volume one over to me, which I read a lot from to get the content for this episode. So thank you as always, Jay, for that. Um, First, he said, uh, you mentioned the $900 suit, which was interesting because I couldn't tell if you meant that $900 for a suit was a lot or not a lot. I guess that you thought of it as being a lot. However, $900 suit is in fact solidly mid-range and 2 to 4000 would typically be at least in California an expensive suit. Holy monkey fucking dog shit. Are you shitting me? I I am taking that $900 suit from what a line that I heard in Liar Liar when I was a kid. Uh, 2 to 4000 dollars for a fucking suit? I I mean, I guess I should know that that's the rate of inflation that <laughs> when Liar Liar came out in the 90s that $900 was expensive for a suit as would be inflated up to 2 or 4000 dollars now, but what the fuck? Yes, I said $900 suit implying that that was an expensive suit because I <laughs> I don't spend $900 for a set of tires on my fucking car right now. I haven't spent $900 on anything for a long time. That is fucking mind-blowing. It's a a window into a world that I have absolutely no finger on the pulse of and know nothing about. So, okay. Thanks for uh, opening up my mind and pissing me off at the corporate world, Jay. I appreciate that. And then uh, next he said, um, I had a question that I would like you to touch on if you have time. It is my understanding that the church recently released some documentation regarding the disorderly person trial. I think I read or heard that this information had been denied or suppressed in the past and was recently admitted to exist and then shared. If I'm right about that, could you tell us a bit about what the admission was? I think this might be interesting to the audience because the church is of late being forced, kicking and screaming to admit more and more historical items that they would like to say nothing about. Uh, 
I haven't heard of that, actually. I haven't done any um, uh, actual research on the Mormon perspective of the disorderly person trial, because as I have read before, most of the apologists uh, just bold-faced deny the veracity of the claim in general. And then once they... Uh, I mean, it was kind of the same thing with the revelation of the seer stone that Joseph used. For a while, the historians would assert that this thing is true, and then the church just denies it. And then more evidence crops up that shows that it is indeed true, and the church just goes silent. And I thought that that's the phase that they're currently at when it comes to the whole disorderly person thing. If any listeners out there know much about this disorderly person trial that the church has released documents on, please send a link over or post on the Facebook page a link of it because that's something that I think a lot of people would be interested in finding out more about and I personally would like to know more about. I just unfortunately haven't taken the time to do the research on it as I hope everybody understands my research time has been devoted to putting out each new episode. Anyway, thanks for sending in the email, Jay, and uh, for expanding the knowledge of the naked mormonism information kingdom i really hope to collect some details on that really soon and share it with everybody if anybody's willing to do the research on um, what the church has said about the disorderly person trial please do so and let me know what you find out thanks jay got an email from charles wallace um charles sent in stuff that i've been looking for that i talked about in this in the previous email with jay um he sent in a very, very short email. I'll just read it here real quick because it has a lot of good shit on it. Uh, hey, love the show. I'd like to share a bit of old Mormon source material I found accidentally on archive.org. It is the Mormons or Latter-day Saints in the Valley of the Great Salt Lake, a history of their rise and progress, peculiar doctrines and present condition, published in 1854. Holy shit. And he sends a link with the actual archive of it. And I'll include that link in the show notes today. It includes a brief history of the church. And from my quick glances, it seems to include a surprising amount of detail, including references to Spalding's book. I'm always interested in that, but I can't imagine that they included anything that isn't recorded in uh, E.B. Howe's Mormonism Unveiled and published in 1834. If there is any original information there in regards to the Spalding theory, I'd be very, very interested in hearing it. Uh, he finishes up the email. Also, I think you would find an outsider's description of Mormon life in Utah in the 1850s interesting. Keep up the good work. Um, I assume that you are referring to that archive that you sent as um, what you are talking about, the outsider's perspective, or uh, the outsider's description of Mormon life in Utah with that 1854 book. Um, I'm going to put this up, like I said, in the show notes and on the Facebook page. If anybody wants to uh, do some research on that and read this book that Charles sent over, please do and let me know what you think. I'm going to try and get around to it at some point, uh, but we'll, we'll have to see. But thanks for sending in the email, Charles. Got an email from Ken here. He said he's just um, he's enjoying the show, and he's a Nevermo, and thanks to David Michael, uh, the Reddit ex-Mormon in my show, he's able to connect with his best friend uh, that's an ex-Mormon better than ever. He says, I'm extremely thankful to all of you for helping me learn about Mormonism and ex-Mormon culture. A few hours listening to history and a boring ass book are well worth it and you're both very entertaining to boot um and just wanted to say thank you for that very much ken thanks for the encouragement uh, he closes his email um in response to a recent email as an atheist convert i've since given myself a motto to help give me purpose posso mit volo meaning i can i will well done ken I really, really like that a lot. Um, it's kind of the same thing where I took the quote from that Coca-Cola billboard of uh, enjoy everything. This is like, I can, I will, just a very, very simple phrase that you can repeat to yourself if you're ever feeling like, oh, God, this fucking sucks, or life is shitty, or whatever. Just say it, posso met volo. I can, I will. And I, you can do anything that you say your mind to. So that was an awesome email and very encouraging. Thank you very much for sending it, Ken. Got an email from Ward. Basically just said uh, they're an Exmo and would love to see this cult of burn. I agree with you. I try not to say it that directly, but I couldn't agree with you more, Ward. 
Lord also says, at work here in British Columbia, we have a visiting worker from Utah. So I had to ask, and he is Mormon, so I could not help but get into it. Well done, Ward. That's what we need, street epistemologists. I am amazed at how little he knows. He knows nothing, for example, of Hoffman forgeries. So fun to watch him spin about anachronisms in the Book of Mormon. That is a great way to argue with believing Mormons, is bring up the Book of Mormon and just... The claims of Joseph Smith as a prophet of God in general, there's plenty of problems there that you can harp on and have discussions with believing Mormons for hours on end, and they don't know how to answer because, uh, well, they haven't been trained in it, especially missionaries. They have no idea about the real history of the church. So if you can get on that conversation with them, uh, stick with it, and that's good fun to have. Uh, Ward goes on to say, I do have a collection of Exmo books and some atheist books I would consider giving you if you need some more reference material. I can send you a list if you would like. Uh, Ward, I really hope to see that list from you. I'm always interested in expanding my knowledge. Um, If there is anything that you're willing to lend out or give up, I would be more than happy to see what you have and take a look at it and see if it's something that could be incorporated into the show or shit just into my own knowledge base in general i like learning new shit whether it's about mormonism or anything other than mormonism but yeah um i'd like to see an email from you ward please send it over and thanks for sending in the email is encouraging thank you i did have to mention real quick i'm going to do an interview on the amateur skeptics podcast um, it's one of the podcasts as part of the dumbass media empire which is something i've kind of been wanting to crack into for quite some time now uh, so I look forward to doing that. That's probably going to be, the interview will probably be, be done on the 29th, um, uh, this weekend. So, um, I'm not sure when the episode will go up after that, but we're going to have that, uh, interview and it's going to be live and, you know, all of us in the same room, really, really looking forward to that. And all of the people that are, uh, involved in that, I appreciate you inviting me on. All right. I think that was all the listener mail to cover there. Um, there were a few new NAMO patrons to thank. First, we had Juvenile Delinquents, Roger and Mark. Thank you both very, very much for your support of the podcast. Um, you guys are at the start of a long, long journey through the ranks of the NAMO Outer Darkness and look forward to seeing you through to the end. Next, there was a new adolescent rebel, Jeff. Thank you very much, Jeff, for your contributions to this show. Your actions will forever have a deep impact on the glowing ventricles buried deep within the heart of the podcast. Thank you, Jeff. Greg and Shelly are two of the best friends that anybody could ever have. They've known each other for quite some time and have hung with each other through thick and thin. Nothing has ever been unattainable for them as a team. Competitive sports are a breeze, to the point that they're always trying new things to stimulate their collective adrenal gland. Not only are they inseparable as friends, but they share everything with each other. No topic is too deep for them to have a discussion about, no matter what the circumstances are. Well, today is no different for Shelley and Greg. It's just business as usual as they're gearing up for the rally car race that they're about to participate in. While they're putting on their flame-retardant jumpsuits and fitting their helmets, Greg and Shelley are in the middle of some very interesting conversations. They're talking about a subject they've rarely ever talked about with each other before today. They're trying to suss out the meaning of life and mortality. They'd been going through life without having contemplated their own existence or even discussing it with each other, but today is different somehow. They're really debating where humans come from and what the ultimate endgame for the human race is, but like everybody who's had this discussion before them, they keep coming up with meaningless profundities that don't really help to answer the real question of existence or offer any kind of solace for these deep philosophical thoughts. Their conversations divert from these deep philosophical conundrums to strategies for the race and then back again, almost like life and this race are analogous to each other somehow. This isn't the first race they've been in together, but rather one race of the many in the tournament they had entered in three weeks ago and one of thousands of races that they'd done together before, but today's race is a big one for them. They've been waiting for this for a long time because this is the most challenging of all the courses they've so far encountered. 
There are a few reasons this track is so viciously treacherous, but the main reason is for Curve 13, known as the Widowmaker Curve. This corner has claimed so many racers that lawsuits are pushing the rally organization to put up railing to reduce the number of cars going off the edge, but so far they haven't budged. Shelley, being a world-class rally driver, hops behind the wheel with Greg as the world's premier rally course navigator and co-pilot. Unknown to the team before the race started, it would be held as a close quarters four-car-per-section race. That meant that four cars would race together right next to each other instead of the rally race being an individual time trial like usual. This was a completely unexpected decision by the organizing staff, but what can you say? They wanted to boost viewer ratings by making things a little more dangerous and intense. So let it be said, so let it be done. The four couples of racers are lined up, staggered two by two, waiting for the starting flag to drop, initiating the race. Shelly wraps up the engine of her state-of-the-art number 24 rally car and looks over at her co-pilot, Greg. They each give a silent nod to each other, their universal symbol of, let's do this. The other three drivers wrap up their engines and all four cars hum in a chorus of straight-piped, high-performance glory. The flag drops and the racers are off in a blur of rally colors and paddle-shifting blips of the finely tuned engines. Greg is barking commands with perfect timing and Shelley is executing every turn and elevation change with a certain grace and comfort achieved by only the best of drivers. Shelley and Greg are burning down this mountain. Turn 5 and 6 and 7 all fly by without the least bit of trouble. The two racers that started in the back of the starting line are struggling to keep up and eventually fall out of sight. However, car number 7 that started right next to Shelly and Greg had jumped ahead by getting a slightly better start off the line and they won't budge from first place. Both cars fly through turns 9 and 10 with our heroes in number 24 right on the tail of the 7 car. They round corner 11 and Shelly sees the opening on the inside of the corner that she had been hoping for the whole time. She grabs a gear and slips through the opening and locks up first place, just in time to round corner 12 and smash the downhill street leading to the Widowmaker. It's a mere third of a mile straight before the near 90 degree Widowmaker bears its flesh devouring fangs. And Shelly knows that this is the most important corner of her life to make successfully. Greg looks over at her and whispers encouragement. You got this. They silently nod at each other and Shelly shoves the accelerator into the firewall. The corner is getting closer and can just barely be seen at the edge of Greg and Shelly's depth perception. Just as they are both silently focused on the corner they are about to encounter and own like champions, an all call over the radio brakes. Mayday! Mayday! Car number seven has lost brakes and is out of control. Greg casts a glance in the rear view mirror where he can see the driver and co-pilot in seven losing their usual composure as they'd come to a realization that the Widowmaker lies ahead as the next corner. Shelly glances in her mirror and sees Seven slowly dropping back. They were both flying down the hill, and Shelly knew that she barely had time to slow herself down before the Widowmaker. Number Seven's driver downshifted to try and use the engine to brake enough for the corner. These rally car engines are made to never die, but Shelly could hear Seven's motors screaming in agony, way above the red line under the weight of the car bolting down the straight without any brakes towards certain death at the hands of Widowmaker. Shelly's eyes dart from the road in front of her with the approaching deadly corner that leads to a sudden 600-foot drop to her mirror as she watches Seven arduously slowing despite their built-up speed and downhill trajectory. She looks at Greg and Greg looks back at her. Greg says, Do you think they'll be alright? Just as the words left his mouth, there's a loud pop from Seven and smoke started to billow out of every seam of the engine compartment. 
The motor had given in to the forces of nature, and the RPMs from 7 had blown a piston head through the block and fired it like a titanium rocket through the carbon fiber hood of the car. The engine was destroyed, and nothing was helping to slow 7 down for the impending corner of doom. Greg knew what had happened as soon as he heard the sound. Greg and Shelley look at each other, internally assessing the situation. You know what we have to do, Greg said. They silently nodded at each other. Shelley dumped the accelerator pedal, dropped two gears, and eased on the brakes a moment before necessary to safely negotiate Widowmaker. She no longer has the corner in mind, but rather a plan. She was going to do something she had done to plenty of racers before while overtaking them in a corner. It's a very simple procedure, and racers sometimes call it backboarding, a term lifted from basketball. When she had used this to her advantage in the past, she would accelerate hard before a corner and gain the inside of the corner on the person she was trying to pass. Then she would slide into that car that was on the outside of the corner, trading paint and giving her extra speed to that car, and using them to slow herself down enough to make the corner. She would do this and then pass the car that she just fucked over that would end up sliding into the grass on the outside of the corner. But this time, she would make her car, 24, the backboard and soak up the extra speed from 7, hopefully forcing them to negotiate Widowmaker at a safe speed. A second after this thought occurred to Shelley, it was time to put the plan into place. Greg has his eye on seven in the mirrors, and Shelly has her eye on her own place in the track. She slows 24 down enough to get right next to seven on the outside of the corner, but both cars are going much too fast to make it. She nudges 24 into the side of seven just as they get to the entrance of the corner. Greg and Shelly look at each other and smile. The plan is in the first stage of working. Shelly cranks the wheel hard to the right, and seven follows suit. Shelly hammers down on the brakes and drops two more gears. 24's engine screams from the struggle of slowing two cars worth of weight. 7 stays on the inside of the corner and hugs the wall with the help of 24 on the outside of the corner. But the momentum from both cars is simply too much for 24 to handle. Just as Shelly and Greg enter the apex of the corner, 24's tires break loose and all traction and control is lost at the worst possible time. 24 soaks up the extra speed and 7 makes the corner safely. The cars part ways as 7 remains under control, but Shelly and Greg and 24 lose any semblance of control they had before. The car's tires are completely locked up and the two best friends are aimed straight at Widowmaker's ledge without any way of stopping or turning to remedy the situation. Greg looks over at Shelley. They both know that their time has come. They would soon be just another statistic, falling victim to the almighty Widowmaker. The car launches off the cliff with certain death below. Shelley and Greg's eyes meet, just as gravity started to gain control over the car and lose control over their human forms inside the car. No verbal communications are necessary. Greg grabs Shelley's hand and says the simple phrase, It's okay, we did it. Time slows to a near halt, just as both of them come to a new level of understanding. What they had just done was the meaning of being human. They were both able and willing to sacrifice their lives to let others live. This was the most humanist action they could ever possibly perform. They had reached the height of humanity by saving other people's lives, and that was something truly special. They both understood just how amazing life is as their car plunges towards the ground at an unquestionably deadly speed. This is the end, and they both know and accept it. The car is aimed nose straight at the ground, and the ground is getting closer and closer with each passing second they remain with hands clenched together. Just as the front of the car touches the ground, Yames intervenes. Yames has seen the sacrifice that Shelley and Greg made and is very pleased with what he has witnessed. 
He places their talisman inside the car, just in front of their clenched hands, and disappears until he's next needed. Greg and Shelly see the glowing translation talisman in front of them and reach their clenched hands out to touch the curiosity, and there's nothing but silence. Back on the mountain, Seven had come to a complete stop on the uphill just after Widowmaker, and his driver and co-pilot had run to the edge of Widowmaker to watch the fate of Shelly and Greg. The car hits the ground and explodes into a massive fireball, ensuring anybody inside would be multiple times dead from the impact of fire. But no bodies would be recovered from 24's wreck that day. Greg and Shelley have moved on to bigger and better things. Thank you both for your support, and welcome as the newest demons in the Nemo Outer Darkness Kingdom. Your support goes a long way to perpetuate the show and help with production costs. I also needed to thank Frank. He's also a new member of the Demon Hood, but he sent in a message saying he didn't need anything from it and just wanted to support the show. So to Shelly, Greg, and Frank, thank you all very much for what you're doing to help the show. It really means a lot more than you could ever imagine. Well, I suppose that's it. Um... As far as next episode goes, I'm not sure what it's going to be because I am planning a trip out to Utah here pretty soon to go to a friend's wedding, and I'm not sure if I'll be able to get in an episode before then. Um, It might be something simple, um, or it might be just a shorter episode or a document reading or something to that effect because I'm going to be pretty busy for this upcoming two weeks. Uh, But just to let you know, I'll probably be cranking that out um, right before I leave for that wedding, and then... um, We'll go back to the normal historical analysis right after that, I would assume. Like I said, it's kind of up in the air right now. I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen. Well, I think that's the plan for next episode. Uh, As far as it goes for this episode, I think that's it. I wanted to say thank you to everybody that's sent in emails or Facebook messages or Twitter or has commented on the Facebook page or has liked it. Uh, I wanted to say thanks to Demonista, as always, for running the Facebook and Twitter pages. She does a fantastic job, and if you're ever interested in learning a lot more about Mormon history than is presented on this show, check out the Facebook page. There's a lot of really interesting links there and good conversation going on. If anybody wants to uh, engage on the Facebook page but doesn't want to be outed or doesn't want that information to show up in their feed, you can send a message to the Facebook page requesting to be added to the NAMO private group. And uh, it might take a few days to get it, but we will eventually get to adding you to the NAMO private group. And there's private discussion going on there with a lot of ex-Mormons and uh, non-Mormons alike. So if anybody's interested in joining up with the private group, send a message and we'll get you added. There's just one more quick thing to do before signing off tonight. Um, Last weekend... I went and saw the Book of Mormon musical that was created by Matt Stone and Trey Parker of uh, South Park. Quite honestly, it is the only play that I've ever been to as a Broadway play. I went to a very short version of Macbeth when I was in sixth grade for a field trip. And for some reason, this, uh, this was a much, much better production. Honestly, I don't want to talk about it too much because there are a lot of spoilers that I want to talk about, but I refuse to do that to the people that haven't seen the play yet. So to all the people that have seen it, Hasa Diga Ibuai, to you all and to all a Diga Ibuai good night. And it's just, I, I have to say the very least amount about it as possible It was amazing, and I cannot recommend it high enough. My expectations for it never could have been as high as it actually achieved. It was absolutely, unbelievably amazing. Um, I will say that I actually attended it with one other ex-Mormon like myself and then two never-Mormon people. And myself and the other ex-Mormon were laughing the whole time. Literally the whole fucking time because of all of the inside jokes and little uh, little winks and nods that they give to anybody that's Mormon that actually has gone through the experience that they're talking about. It's just, uh, it's it's absolutely amazing. Please, please check out the Book of Mormon musical. Um, find tickets for it. I had to buy mine seven months in advance and I barely got them in time. 
Uh, if it's playing anywhere near you, I cannot recommend it high enough. That's all I'm really going to say about it. I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but please, <laughs> that's, that's the best I can say. Let me, let me see if there's some notes here. Um, let's see. Okay, so some of my notes are um, Planet Orlando, Bull Poop, um, Book of Mormon Up the Ass, so much fucking. Um, Joe's battle with dysentery. Uh, <laughs> I took four pages of notes and I was just madly scrawling them in the darkness. And the handwriting is terrible and it's not on the lines. But it was unbelievably hilarious. And so many of the things are just... <laughs> uh, <laughs> the evil butt fucking guitar solo was amazing in, in hell. Uh, I... <laughs> I can't I can't say any more about it. Just go see it. It's amazing. Go see the play. You will not regret any of it, especially if you're an ex-Mormon because you'll get all of the extra little jokes that they throw in there just for ex-Mormons. It's amazing. All right, that's all I have to say about that. That's everything for this episode. Hope to talk at you again here on the Naked Mormonism podcast. <laughs>